folks, welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. It's 11 o'clock Central Texas time. You've heard that before. You know what? I had to up my intro game. Why? Because Steve Staggs deserves it, right? You know, he needs something fresh happening, right? Folks, I'll tell you what. This is going to be a really good time because we're here. We're hanging out. It is Friday, November 3rd, and I'll tell you what. We need Jesus more than we ever could have imagined, man. And I'm just so thankful that you're here. Um, you know, when you have a breakthrough and of course, you know, it seems like every time I talk to Steve with you guys on this stream, like my mind gets blown, but he always talks about this, like 24 to 48 hour or 72 hour thing is that when you have these things that blow your mind, you see them then in action. And if you think about good education, what's good education? I remember having good teachers in school and they would say, Hey, we're going to learn this principle. We're going to learn this idea, but then we're going to practice it, right? And it seems like in the context of this created order that that also is the case and that we see that happening. Like we go, oh, wait, I learned that. And then I'm like, oh, I see that in real life. And then I experience it and it drives it home. And that's the cool thing. That's how you kind of can see the truth in all of this is that it it resonates beyond just, oh, that's a really nice story. Thanks a lot. And now it's like, boom, wow, you're going to practice this. Well, some of these things that we end up practicing aren't very comfortable, and that's going to be the theme of today. But let's invite Steve, the man of the hour. What's up, Steve? Hello there, my friend. How are you doing? You know what? I'm actually doing well. I don't know if you can pick up on my energy, but I'm pretty... Um, I had a call like, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you get connected with people that you haven't connected with before, and it's so energizing because you're like, okay... I didn't coordinate this at all. I didn't know this person. And this is like the perfect, perfect person to meet. And it's like, thank you, Lord. You're good. And yeah. you're working all these things behind the scene. And you're obviously out in front. You're strategic. And we we need to follow you. And it's like, this is how he makes our path straight. That's how it feels to me, at least. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I remember years and years ago, I heard a guy uh, describe life with Jesus as high adventure. Yeah. And I have never found a better way of describing it, man. It is high adventure. <laughs> high drinks. That's so great. <laughs> high adventure. I love that. Well, let's say hello to the chat, Steve. Um, we got quite a few people here this morning. Hexonium is is saying, hey, um, needs to, he's talking about a guy named uh, Mark Mallet, it looks like. Look at U.S. Grace Force uh, stream. Cool. Yeah. Check that out, man. Thanks so much for that. Mike Ostell's back. That's always yeah, a good yeah. sign, right? The end of the is getting depressing. <laughs> yeah, but it's good to have Jesus as well as y'all get great friends. You know, hopefully we can pick you up and encourage you and and uh, give you a shot of hopium, I suppose, today. Just hope in, in the Lord Jesus, because that's, yeah, I, I'm, I got my shot this morning. So we're, we're in good shape. But Mike, thanks for being here. Um, we just, we're with you, even if we're not in present with you, we're with you in in bearing all of these things. You're not alone. I think that's the, the number one thing. Absolutely. And then Sam Kemp getting on the road, going to catch the rerun. Have a blessed day. Thanks uh, so much for being here yeah, or a bleeded day, Sam. Thanks for that. Um, identity blocks, dude. Okay. So here's what's cool. So ID has been in like all my streams. Like it's been so fantastic to have you here. Um, and so identity blocks have been in our community, like forever. OG of OGs. And, I hadn't seen them in, and maybe it was a different handle, but just to have you here, seeing you in all these streams, I really appreciate you being here. I mean, this is this these streams, Steve, are not for everyone, you know, and that's yeah. that's always, you know, the lowest viewed of all of the things that I do or this. But I also recognize that I'm not really doing this for the the number of viewers as much as I am for documenting this journey. And I, I honestly, I think about my kids. Yeah, potentially grandkids when I think about this is like we're documenting something and it's it's called real life. You know, I, I feel like a, a form of discipleship, a form of like hanging out, talking about Jesus is good for good for the bones. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I get it. I get it. David Lee is here as usual, all the way from Southwestern Indiana, David Lee, really loved, by the way, I talked to him earlier and he was like, man, Steve talking about all this moving stuff and I'm in the process of moving and how like amazing it was to hear those stories. And I think that was a big encouragement to him, Steve. Awesome. Awesome. 
So Akin Emaciated is here. And then Anthony Munoz. You don't know Anthony Munoz, but Brandon believes that this guy is the youngest billionaire in um, in the history of the world. Oh, wow. Really? Maybe, maybe not yet, but we're believing that for him. <laughs> No, so he's uh, 12 years old and about to get, yes, <laughs> get on yeah. the map. Huh? Well, no, he's he's a super, super guy. Anthony Munoz is a Brandon's such a big fan, and he's just been so supportive. So good to see you, Anthony awesome. Munoz. We always give him. But I think, you know what's so cool? I, you know the reason I continue this um, this thing about Anthony Munoz being this billionaire? I have found in my life, I could count on one hand, Steve, the number of people that look me in the eye and said, I think you're great and you can do it. Hmm. 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 One hand, one hand and wow. probably less than five, five times. Yeah. And it's like those people think about this. How many times have you looked a young person in the eye and said, you know what? I see something in you and you can do it. I believe in you. Have you ever had a situation like that, Steve? Can you think about like, how, it's not a common thing. And I think that's the, why God invented grandparents, in my opinion. Like, that's what you should do if you're a grandparent. Look your kid, your grandkids in the eye and be like, I believe in you. Can, are you in the same situation as me? I mean, did you have people in your life who were just absolutely for you and fans of you and built into you and encouraged you and and were edifying to you? I didn't. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I... I've never even thought about it, but as you were describing and pre prepping your question, I was going back in the Rolodex of time and, and um, boy, man, I, I would be hard pressed to find anybody or to recall. Um, but hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue giving a thought here. And if somebody comes to mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a shout out. Yeah, well, and you, you've mentioned in the past, I think, when it came to baseball, your parents or your mom or somebody was like, you know, they didn't keep you from going out and playing baseball in the yard. And, you know, the, but I guess what I'm getting at is the reason I do this with Anthony Munoz is because, and I do this with my own son. I, I think about this when I wake him up in the morning. So I go in there and wake him up. And it's funny, I give my wife a hard time because her way of waking people up is turn on the lights and be like, get out of bed. You know, she's like the drill sergeant. <laughs> and of course I don't like waking up that way. So I kind of creep in there. I turn on the closet light instead of the main light. You know, I don't want to like totally fry his retina <laughs> and I'll go over and sit on his bed and I'll rub his back and I'll be like, what is that? <laughs> and I was thinking about this. I was like, why do I do that? I, I I'm doing that because that's what I wanted when I was a kid. My dad was always at work and around. I was thinking like, is somebody really for me? Yeah. Is somebody a fan of mine? Is somebody like, no matter what, I'm in your court? And I feel like, why do I talk about Jesus with you? Because that's who he said he is to me. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it, what's interesting about it is we have so many tapes that we play in our minds of what people have said to us. And that's going to be part of the theme of today is the yeah. voices that we're listening to. And they're not just the devil with a pitchfork and horns and a red spandex suit. Yeah. But there's yeah. all of these spirits of things that are speaking to us a lie. Yeah. And so part of the reason I do this with Andy Munoz is we believe in you, buddy. It's the same thing with Mike Ostell. Come on, Mike. We're with yeah. you. Yeah. Right on. Right on. You know, I had a, it, in my era, and, you know, there's all kinds of shows and stuff like that about it is, um, you know, there, we didn't talk a lot about you know, about stuff, you know, it was kind of the yeah. uh, kids are seen and not heard kind of a thing and um, nose to the grindstone kind of those, those things. But um, my dad was a man of a few words. I mean, his, in, the entirety of his training on how to handle finances, for example, was to live within your means. Pretty good well, one. I had, I had absolutely no idea what that meant. Yep. What do you mean, live within your means? And that now he, those were a few words. There was a lot packed in there. But for a kid, I had absolutely no idea what that meant, you know? 
Um, and for years, I didn't know what it meant. But one of the things about, uh, about my dad was that he never missed one of my games. Yeah. Uh, I was playing ninth grade C football, 10th grade B football. It'd be freezing cold, raining. And he would be literally the only person in the stands watching me play. So though he wasn't very verbose in, in his encouragement and the way you asked your question, but his presence was 100%, you know, that way. Um, I remember when I was in ninth grade, you know, I received when I was the, the baseball coach, you know, I won the most valuable player. And when I was coming up, to receive the uh, the award, he said, this young man has an opportunity similar to what I had, which was to be able to one day play professional baseball. Okay, that's that's one you can mark off right there. Yeah, and it was like, whoa, wow, wow. Somebody, you know, and his name was Jim Musburger and he was, he was uh, Wolfsburger, excuse me. And uh, during practice, he used to, get on the mound, he'd say, okay, if one of you can even touch one of my pitches, you don't even have to hit it here, just touch it. Then you don't have to run laps. <laughs> well, you, guess what? And then he would up the ante. Time. If any one of you can do it, then nobody has to run laps. Whoa. Well, I would, I would routinely drive him deep, you know, which was – not only did I make contact, I, I had the physical ability to actually, you know, take him to task, which was all part of the fun. Yeah. And so, you know, to hear that was was tremendous. Um, and so, yeah, there. If I give some thought, there are some people in way back there, but it was not is not, unfortunately, a common thing. Yeah. Which I, I think, think is what your point is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think. And there's a balance, right? There's a balance between, oh, Johnny, you're the greatest. You're going to be the greatest of all time. And you're going to be a great singer. And, you know, Johnny's tone deaf. And, you know, <laughs> let's not lie to people. Yeah, right. But let's also let's also point out and, and, you know, breathe life into people. Yeah, That's the right. thing I feel like is so, you know, in, in part of that makes me feel like this idea that love covers a multitude of sins. There's something you're like, you know what? When it's true love that's being expressed, these other things disappear or at least washed away. And so it's a part of this whole theme of today, actually, that I want to get your get your thoughts on. But Alan's here. Um, hello, let's go. Absolutely. Yeah. Carter Hill, of course, is here. He loves the high adventure of it all. I, I know you guys have been journeying along in this process of high adventure as well. So yeah. good to see you here. Um um, do, do, look at that Carter Hill. Look at he's, he's, yep. I believe in you and you can do it. By the way, Jesus believes you and you can do it. That includes everyone on the stream. Amen. That's good. He's practicing it. Um, right that is, that is awesome. And then there's Anthony Munoz has been watching since episode one. Big thanks to heartbeat and Mr. Staggs for opening my eyes to the spiritual area of life. Wow. Anthony Munoz. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that you're watching. Yes. You know, I, I mentioned in the green room to Steve that when we were talking, I said, you know, you don't know what the impact of this stuff is unless you kind of get an echo in the canyon. So I appreciate the uh, echo in the canyon from Anthony Munoz that there are people who, you know, I, I look at the stats and I see that people are watching. But, you know, this is this is a lot to consume and it's a lot to think about. And not everybody has that kind of time. So Steve said many times, hey, if you got some interest, you know, it's not what we say. It's what Jesus helps you understand, right? Yeah. There's a lot of words out there, but he, the things that penetrate inside are, are not of our our uh, our effort. So thanks so much for that, Anthony. I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, so, so let me get into this. I had a really rough week, Steve, and you know some of that. Um, but what really came out of that was... I see all the time, right? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. So let me kind of set the stage and, and really get your thoughts on this, because this is huge. And I think anyone that watches this can relate to this. What I've come to relate to over this last year 
is that if if Jesus is alive and he speaks and he's strategic and he is out front and that we are the branches and he's the vine and without him we can do nothing and he only does what he hears the father doing and he is literally you know speaking and he sees us as sons right as an heir and we are elohim man with him right and we are an extension of him and in the ideal set of you know structure of his nature and character that when we are in this process of walking with him holding each thought captive moment to moment not just in a quiet time with coffee but in all of life that when it says it will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, it's true. And what is the guarding that is happening? Well, what I have seen, and this is the way I would articulate it, is imagine the air in this room is, is sewage mixed with feces. Mm. And we're literally, imagine you're underwater, you can breathe the feces that are in the water. And we're in this thick, disgusting, you get to a certain point, your nose blind and you don't even see it. Yeah. And you're in this cesspool. And what you don't realize, and I said it on the last stream, that there are ways in which things get in. I think about viruses. They can get in through your eyes. You rub your eyes with dirty hands or it comes through your nose, or your mouth, or your ears. There are places where it can infest you. And we think about this spiritually as what we're listening to. And of course, you know, we pick up on these things in a lot of different ways. What I've recognized is that there's a lot of voices, and I don't mean audible voices, but there are a lot of narratives that I'm listening to that are not Jesus. Yeah. And what I've realized is the whole concept of action and proaction, right? This idea that I'm reacting to something is that I have this choice. And you said the other day, you said that choices are these seeds of this creation right they they actually are these seeds that grow into something which totally makes sense when it comes to um you know the wages of sin is death right you who are you who are you paying right who's paying you who are you working for and what i recognized over this last week of going through a very very difficult time is i felt very very weak and i felt very very easily blown around by these spirits and voices of things that were not of him yeah and i realized i felt very weak steve i felt like i've got no self-control i've got no ability to manage this and now i know that's not true but i was listening like lie after lie after lie and some of those coming directly from myself some of those spirits i want to define what that is right because one of the things i, I notice in you steve and you're like hey i've been doing this for a while is what i admire is your steadiness and i admire your patience and to me that obviously isn't by accident <laughs> and so as somebody that is wired as emotionally as i am and you know i love the great enthusiasms and i love being in the the arena but also i feel like i can get knocked over easily how do you I know that's a lot, but I wanted to tee that up as really the theme for at least this first hour. Yeah. Um, well, what, what you're, you're describing, um, and I think it's right. It, it, anyone who starts um, putting their toe in the pond of the game, if you will, anyone who actually starts getting in the game will experience the things that you're talking about. I mean, life all by itself um, is, is built around adversity. Uh, and so, you know, we all experience that at some, in some level. Uh, now, we usually give more clinical kinds of answers or descriptions about it, particularly in today's world. You know, there's a there's a name and a term for everything. Um, uh, I remember, by way of example, uh, the Lord took me through a period of about 15 years, where every time I turned around, I found myself counseling somebody, and I wasn't interested in doing that. You know, 
yes, I recognize that that Jesus has called me to do some teaching. He's called me to pass on what he's taught me, what I've learned. And I'm happy to do it, thrilled to do it. But I'm I do it. My interest is in doing that out of a relationship, not out of some kind of uh, dictum of how this is how it's done, follow this and that's it. It's more, for me, it's more relational, it's discovery oriented. Let's talk about it, let's discover it. Once we discover it, hey, put on, you know, fasten your seatbelt because you're gonna get your chance to take a ride. Enjoy the ride while you're doing it. Take close, meticulous notes while you're doing it because <laughs> there's something fa fabulous to learn. That's more my style of, you know, of teaching. It's, it's much more relational. But in today's world, you know, they've got a label and, you know, for everything. And one of the things that I found out during that, you know, probably 15 years is that, uh, these sterile systems that are in operation apart from Jesus are great at uncovering the problem to let you see the problem. They're horrible at solving the problem. And so, and so, so many times what I would find is that, uh, that the people the Lord was connecting me with, they had gone through all kinds of counseling, you know, psychology session, I mean, all kinds of stuff for years and years and years with the great hope and expectation of getting better, only to discover that they were worse because at least before they didn't know what the problem was. You know, now they both know the problem and don't know what the answer is. Amen. And so incredible frustration that would grow out of that. And so it was simply yeah, I get that. Don't expect the leopard to be able to do more than what he's been built to do. So the world operating apart from Jesus only has certain capabilities. And to expect it to perform above those capabilities is to not really understand what's going on. Jesus is the guy who has the answers because he's the guy who built the program. And so, you know, we've said that a thousand times probably now on this, on these streams, you know, that, hey, we can talk about a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, there's only one, in my view anyway, there's only one opportunity presented and only one solution available. The opportunity is to look at that situation through the eyes of Jesus and to learn how he sees and hears it what he intends to do about it, and then become a student to learn how he deals with those particular kinds of circumstances. And in every situation, he will then show you how he has built you to be superior to the problem. Wow. If you'll just take the time to be a student with him, to learn how this thing works. And I've not found an exception to that, by the way. And so, when I hear what I hear, what you're describing is, yep, you've just gone through the process. Friday was pretty cool for you. Saturday was was exceptionally cool. By Monday, you were in the middle of it. Guess what? That's the game. And here on Friday, you're going to talk about what it was like and what you learned out of the whole thing. So I'm excited to find out what that's all about. <laughs> well, you just said that one of the most pithy statements here. And I have to say it again, you have been built to be superior to the problem. Yes. Will you will you extrapolate on that? You have been built to be superior to the problem. And that's every problem. That's every problem. Every problem. Um, it goes back, it goes back to understanding this, you know, the vision of God and why he created. Um, one of the things we've, again, we've talked about, I've been astounded for years is we have no clue why God created. Yeah. We're given some kind of an answer, but the answer really doesn't make any sense if you take time to step out and actually look at the answer, you know. Um, 
And so, Jesus, why did the Father want to build? I mean, was he a lonely dude? Was he, you know, just looking for something to do? What? Why did he build? Well, he built this thing, Steve, so that his man could rule his creation with them in the fullness of his nature and character. That's his vision. And so, Steve, if you want to hang with me, that's what I'm about building. That's my mission. And so if you want to be a part of what I'm doing, that's my mission. Come follow me. That's what we'll do. Well, if you're going to rule, guess what you have to be? Superior to the thing you're ruling. And so what, what is the nature of rulership? It is to neutralize what jeopardizes. And so what do problems do? Well, there are problems that are, um, that are, I would call them positive beneficial problems because they, they are indicating that you're coming up to a limit. Uh, and so guess what you do? Your, if your mission is to grow beyond the limit, you have to be superior to the limit. Well, guess what Jesus says? You could do nothing apart from me. So if you're going to be superior to the limit, guess who you have to be hooked up with? The guy who's superior to the pro, to the limit, right? Who Because he's the one who has been given all authority. You see how these things are, are interconnected? It's amazing. And so... And so, yeah, we are built to be superior to the problem. Why? Because we have been, we have been created to rule. And so to rule, you must be able to neutralize what jeopardizes. Okay, let's, let's pause and camp out there. This is huge. You know, what's interesting is I want to be sensitive to the fact that if there's anything I've learned in my just 50 years on planet Earth is that repetition is helpful because even for me i've heard this a lot from you steve whoa sorry about this hang on i've got uh i've got my computer going crazy um must be getting okay. into something important yeah yeah no <laughs> what happens is when a call comes in like everything disappears on my screen okay so uh, the repetition of this even for me like i, I want to say it because it's packed with so much and it's like we all often talk about this like we could literally talk about this one word or this one idea for hours and hours. So yeah. I want to pause here because it's these big things. You know, I, I joke with you that I, I met you and I came in on chapter seven <laughs> and it's like, I went chapter six, chapter eight, chapter five, chapter nine, like we, we bounced around. And then out of all of this stuff, we come back into the order of things. And you know what? You just said it like the number one thing. You asked the question early on, you're like, why did you create? And it's interesting that out of every church sermon and everything I've ever gone to, no one's ever said, hey, let's take a minute to stop and look around and say, we're in the midst of something. Yeah. It's pretty big deal. I've woken up again to it. Yeah. Why is it here? Yeah. Okay. Well, that would be the fundamental reason. You know, everybody's like, what's the meaning of life? Well, okay. What is it? What does he say it is? And so what you have said, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that man would rule his creation, not man's creation, but God's creation with him. Yes. In his nature and character. In the fullness of his nature and character. In the fullness. Okay. Well, that's even better adjective here. Fullness. Okay. So with him... So, okay, so we take that and we say, all right, the reason that God created this whole thing that we find every day, at least thus far, I've woken up in the middle of, is so that with him, he, he wants to basically us to rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Yes. Okay. So I would just say to anyone that's listening or hearing this, I'd write that down. I just wrote it down. I'm like, write that down. Okay. If, in fact, there's a God of all creation who's decided that instead of him just running everything, he is using you, right? He, he's, he, you got to, what I get from that is, I got work for you to do, son. 
Yep. That's what I hear out of it. Is that yep. fair? Well, that's why you got the signet ring. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So the question is, do you see yourself as someone who has a role to play? I think a lot of people, we're just talking about breathing life into people. I think a lot of people have been beat down so much and people within this world have told them they're nothing and they're worthless. And I just think about losing all hope and looking at destruction and all the result of people's decision-making. And they just like, I, I have no hope left. And, you know, I, I see that in just regular life, people who've been so criticized and so beat down and have lost this hope. And what you're saying is, if we go back to the very, very core of this, if you're breathing air and you're above ground, there is a role for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then on the on the flip side of that, when you're, you know, getting the tar beat out of you and, you, you know, you just can't seem to make it and things are just going the wrong direction and everything seems to be going haywire on you. The same question applies. Learn to step outside of that and say, why is this going on? What is happening here? All I want to do is this, that, or the other. What the heck is going on here? Why is this? Why is every time I attempt to get something done, something pops up out of nowhere and smashes me in the mouth? What is going on there? Yep. See, we will say those kinds of things in a woe is me mentality a lot of times, which is just an indication of how badly we've been beaten. But let me tell you what, once you get to the place where you step back and say, okay, why is this going on here? What exactly is happening? Why does whatever it is going on think that I'm such a threat, it's got to beat the crap out of me? What's happening here? See, and instead of taking a, a victim's woe is me approach, taking a strategic approach to say, wait a minute, hold on just a minute here. Happening once, okay. Happening twice, a coincidence. Happening three times, okay, we got a pattern. What's going on with the pattern here? See, we're not taught to think this way. No. See, and yet it's the very basic fundamentals that are, that are attributes that are necessary if you're going to rule. You can't, if you're ruling, you can't say, oh, look at that dirty thing that's going on there. Oh, I'm, I guess we're just going to have to let it go. No, you say, stop. Well, and, and Steve, that's what I ran into this last week. So let me just share with you how I felt. Yeah. I did not feel like I had the ability to step outside of it. Yeah. I really didn't. And, and I want to be honest about that. I mean, you and I were on the phone and I was like feeling like I was going to hyperventilate. I literally thought I might pass out. Yeah. And, and maybe I would have, I mean, whatever, but that fear and anxiety at that moment and in subsequent times after that, I felt out of control. I felt like I could not, you know, it, it seems like, Hey, that's really easy. It's just step outside of it. And I was literally in the midst of this thing going, why can't I step outside of it? And I mean, the things that rush into your head, Steve, the yeah. things that you, and it's interesting what, so you made this really good point. And this is kind of what I want to want to direct it to is why, yeah. why would anyone care about drawing you off sides, getting you into a position where you don't feel like you can back out from it because it is, it's like a slavery. It's like you are, you're captive to yeah. it. Yeah. And I think so many people, you know, you even say, well, there's this woe is me. Well, that's defeat. Yeah. You have, you have literally been defeated. And there's a lot of people in this world. I mean, my parents were a lot this way too, would look at the world as saying, well, everyone's out to get you. And that you're literally waiting for the shoe to drop. That yeah. it's, you know, you're just an inch away from devastation and you can create that future for yourself, even when there aren't spirits going, Hey, I'm going to try to jab you. Yeah. 
But when you're in the midst of it and it's overwhelming, whether it's anxiety or fear or anger or all of these things that certainly are not um, of his nature and character, how do you deal with that? And what is, I mean, well, let's start with why. Why there's clearly those within the spiritual realm who believe it's worth their time to keep you from being or doing what you're you're designed to do to rule and reign in his nature and character and we see that as like i think it's helpful to understand that it's not just you're I'm mentally unstable it's that you are in the midst of like an attack how 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 do you how do you describe that i, I want to be able to put it into a scenario in which i can kind of put some handles on it if i can yeah Okay, let's take the opportunity to give, give a little background so that when, when I answer, there'll, there'll be just some con, a little bit of context for right. it. And again, this is one of those things we could spend one or more episodes, you know, dealing with. But um, there is a certain hierarchy within the kingdom of darkness that um, exists because that's how God created the hierarchy of the angelic realm. There is a there is a hierarchy in his creation. It's not like the higher like the way we think of hierarchy. We think of hierarchy as the ones on top get to tell everybody else what to do, and our, that's not the way it works. The hierarchy is designed to deal with different levels within the creation, um, and so in in that area, we've heard if we use um, New Testament terms like um, evil spirit, um, honoria nomadicus, we hear of unclean spirits. Um, anyway, these are the lowest levels within, within Satan's realm, and their express task is to attack people at the base nature of where they live. So they'll attack um, desires, attitudes, um, physical traits, uh, and their whole intention is to get us to the place where we're thinking more about us than anything else. We become the center of the universe. And of course, as parents, we know that, you know, uh, that old adage that eventually you have to tell your children is, hey, you're not the center of the universe. Well, I wonder how many of us as adults has grown out of that point of view. You know, and and to my experience, not many of us. Uh, but that's the intention. The intention is to make sure we're at the center of the universe because that's how the culture of the world under Satan's rule works. No matter how you package it, man has to be at the center of that. If man is not at the center of that, it doesn't work. And so we could we can get into that at some point if you like. Um, and so that's how that's how it is designed and structured. So that's part one. Part two, think now strategically. Um, if you were a member of the um, of the police force, or you were uh, head of the mili- uh, of the U.S. military, would you send your troops to uh, police, or to keep in line your allies or citizens who were uh, law abiding? Is that where you would direct your resources? No. No, you would direct your resources to those who are posing a threat, whether they're in the form of nations for armies or if they're in the form of citizens who are rebellious and uh, lawbreakers, you know, at the citizenry level. So my point is that Satan does not dispatch his military resources to people who are not a threat to him. He only because he has limited resources. So he's going to direct those resources. Okay, 
Next, so that's second level. Third level, where is he going to direct and to whom is he going to direct? Well, there are going to be people who are in their circumstances because of the life choices they have made. And so Satan doesn't need to mess with you one bit. You're already doing a fine job of screwing up your life. You know, he's not going to mess with you. Uh, he may exploit you. He may use you uh, at a point in time, but he's not going to expend any of his precious resources to deal with you. Um, so learning how to step out of a situation, we'll come back to that in just a minute, because you and I talked about it on Monday, but is the reason for that in the why is why the heck am I here? Am I here because, and once again, this is kind of the opening uh, introduction to the, to the 60s white paper, you know, am I here because of the choices I made? Because I'm making really stupid choices? And so I'm simply bearing the harvest of the decisions I've made in the past that this is what I have sown in the field of my life. And so this is what I'm, the fruit I'm bearing. And these are really horrible decisions. You know, I should not have taken that gun, that neutral, ins that neutral device and put it in some guy's head and then stolen his wallet. That was a bad decision. And so now I, I'm in a lot of trouble for that. Well, guess what? This has nothing to do with demonic forces. You're doing, you're wrecking your life all by yourself. And because you are willing to do that, if necessary, you'll be called upon to act on behalf of and as an agent of that kingdom if it needs to take care of business with somebody. And if you think that's just a, a philosophical statement, it's because you're not in the game. You don't understand how absolutely real and meticulously involved in human affairs that the kingdom of darkness is, okay? Down to pennies. Now, on the other hand, there are people who are actually trying to get their life turned around, trying to do what's right. They may not even be trying to do anything that Jesus is saying because they've never even been exposed to that idea, but they're still trying to get their life right somehow, some way, and they just can't get there. Ah, well, that's a person who is a truth seeker who represents a very real threat to the kingdom of darkness. And there will be all kinds of things that can come up to deal with that. So thus the need to step back and say, okay, why is this going on? There is a pattern that's happening that I need to observe in order to understand what is happening in my life and what is it that is creating this problem? You see? So the circumstance, not one thing that I've talked about is circumstance oriented. It's decision oriented from the person, from the inside out, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that's where creative processes then are released into the creation. All right. And if that is for purposes of good, ah, you represent a potential threat, not because it's good, but because of where that good could lead. Right. We talked about, you know, Whitney, for example. Yeah. Right. Whitney's a truth seeker. If she keeps asking the questions she's asking and she keeps on the path she's keeping on, she may be involved in some of the weirdest garbage that the planet can ever muster up. But if she keeps asking the question and keeps seeking what is true, she's going to come, end up headlong face to face with Jesus, who's going to say, hey, glad you finally showed up. You want to know more. Would you like to know how this thing actually works? You've been seeking. You're about to find. Are you interested? Okay. Why? Well, that is the intolerable risk that exists for everyone who is actually seeking to do what is true. Okay. So guess what? Now you, 
as long as we stay in that circumstance and as long as we only look at the circumstance in the present moment of what it's doing, we'll just be like a guy tied to a pole. We'll just keep running in circles, digging a big old hole, thinking that something's happening or we're trying to get things done, but we're not going anywhere. But the person who will stop, step outside of that thing, even if it's just in the form of declaring I'm stepping out, which like for you, okay, did you eventually step out? Yep. Were you able to in the moment? No. What was important, that you weren't in the moment or that you actually ended up outside, stepping outside of it? That's a good question. Yeah, I would say the reason you were able to step outside is because you said, I'm going to step outside, whether I feel like I'm doing it now or not. Yeah, no. I, issuing yeah, a decree of rulership. Well, let's talk about that because that's, that's, that's huge. That's a long well, answer. <laughs> well, one of the things we talked about a lot, I, I've told you many times, I've always been frustrated because I felt like I didn't get any practical, you know, what can I do if I'm in this situation, practical stuff. And if there's anything we talk about, it's the practical, yes. right? Like, hey, what can I do? Yes. Okay, so I want to I want to repeat back to you what I heard you say. One of the principal focuses of the the system of darkness is to get you to focus on yourself, meaning man-centered, right? Yeah. So this idea that I'm most important in what I need and what I want is, you know, and I think about that as, you know, displayed as narcissism in, in some ways. And boy, do we have a, a, a an entire uh, scrolling population on phones that are literally feeding that, right? And so, okay, if, if I can get you to essentially see yourself as separate, right? Because we, we established at the beginning of this that this idea of with him, rule with him and his nature and character. Okay, so if that's why he created, yeah. then the adversary in the second part you said, why would I direct my resources at someone that's already quote unquote out of the game? Yeah. I mean, there's no point. It's already been effectively you're out. And so what I hear you saying in the practical terms is, if I'm just selfishly motivated, I believe that I'm the descendant of a monkey and I am, um, and this is the best it's going to get. And I just need to get mine. I'll step on your neck to do it. Um, and I'm about amassing these things because if I can convince you that having more money is going to be fulfillment for you or sex or drugs or whatever it is, or I can get you to the point where you're so, you're so beat down that all you can do is self-medicate, you're out of the game. So you're no threat to me. And so I've been effective in you being man-centered because yeah. you're now not focused on a God-centered with him rulership in his nature and character. So you're out. Congratulations and not in the game. The third thing you said is the decisions that you make day to day can get you into a bind. And of course, yeah. you know, there's that term we use from the Bible that is... Um, the wages of sin is death, right? And I was thinking about this is we do li we live with a harvest of these decisions. And the harvest term is great because you talk about a seed. Yeah. Right. Like I, I make a decision. Yeah. I decide to take that gun and animate that gun. And I, you know, I might have justified. I'm like, I think that this is the right reason because I need to get mine and I go and take from you. Um, and of course, you know, you're going to live with the consequences of those decisions. What's really fascinating to me is that so many people who have gotten into really difficult situations find themselves either in prison or at the end of themselves or like the people who, you know, go through 12 step programs or, or whatever. They're literally going, all right, I'm acknowledging that this is unmanageable by me. And I think that something really, I mean, this fits so clearly into why that works Yes. is because you kind of go, I've been trying to go my own way. And that's that's my story completely. I was convinced that I had all the skill and ability and talent to be able to take it the distance until I didn't. Yeah. And then all crumbled around me and I was, but I had nothing. And it was almost like I had to take all the air out of the room for you to notice that I'm here. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's how, that's how it felt. It's like, okay. Because if the air is out of the room, you're not thinking about scrolling on your phone, right? You're, yeah. you're looking at how do I get some air? So what I think is incredible about this is you gave this practical application at the end of that. And you asked me that question, like, what did you do and how did you do it? 
would you speak about this idea of whether it's verbally or not telling them to stop because what in my mind I see is Neo in the movie when he finally recognizes who he is. Yeah. He literally looks around, flexes his muscles, the walls go brrr, right? And you think about who he is. He is the one yeah. that has power over the matrix, the creation. He has a role. And the all the agents shoot their bullets and they come slow and he literally says, no. It seems like what you're suggesting is that functionally actually is true, that you have this ability. And it says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God will give you a way out that you can stand up underneath it, which I think is an amazing like picture. Like whenever you think about standing up underneath like a tent and pushing it up and saying no. Is that what you're saying? That you literally in the midst of this, when you understand, am I operating with him in his nature and character? No. Definitely wasn't, Steve. Well, guess what? You can step out and you can say no to this. Yeah. What are you saying no to, Steve? Yeah, great. You're For those who have spent any time in church or Sunday school or read the Bible at all, they'll be familiar um, with the statement that Jesus made um, to one of the disciples about, letting your yes be yes and your no be no, and all else besides is evil, is the way Jesus described it. And so we're basically taught that what Jesus is telling us is that we need to be truthful people. When we say something, we need to mean it. Well, sorta. Um, but when, you know, eventually got you know, for me personally, it was like, wait a minute, it's just one of these Mark IV kinds of situations where he's teaching a very, what appears to be a very basic lesson, but he's got more up his sleeve. Well, what he has up his sleeve when he's talking about this, that the only way you get is by talking to him about it. You know, what did you mean when you said you need to let your yes be yes and your no be no and all else besides is evil? Duh, that seems pretty flippin' basic. Who doesn't know that? So what do you got up your sleeve, Lord? What do you think? What were you actually saying? And out of that kind of a conversation, you'll get things like, that's just so fascinating with Jesus. You'll start seeing things the way he sees it. Well, Steve, has anybody taught you or have you ever thought that yes has a purpose? And no, likewise, has a purpose. Well, I can't speak for anybody else, but I never got that deep into it. Right. You know? And so it's like, well, no, what is it? He says, well, the purpose of yes is to empower so as to mobilize. Okay. The purpose of no is to protect. So, and... And what a person says is evidenced by what they do. So regardless of what a person says with their lips, their behavior will tell you whether it's a yes or no. If they say no, and yet they're empowering so as to mobilizing the very thing they've said no to, guess what they've actually said? They said yes. I cannot tell you how that simplified my life. You know, in dealing in the business environment and other people that I was around, I stopped listening entirely to what they said. I listened to the extent of their behavior. And then, and we've seen that before, right? Don't listen to what I say, watch what I do kinds of things. So we're, we have some awareness of this. So when you stand up and you say no to something, what you're doing is you're protecting. You understand that the reason you are saying that is because you are protecting something that is about to be exploited. So in your in the conversations on, you know, on Monday, it was, no, they don't get to. Remember that discussion? Yep. No, they don't get to rule. That isn't how this was. This, this is not how this is played. No, 
they don't get to rule, period. What are you doing? You're protecting rulership. Yeah. You're not transferring or giving standing to something that is trying to, to hijack your ability and authority to rule. That's what's actually the game that's being played. They have no standing to rule, and now they're trying to get it from you by getting you to submit to the attack on your emotions so that you'll yield to the emotions. So what is then, what is then ruling? Your emotions. No, emotions are very true. They're very accurate. They tell you what's going on. They just don't get to rule. They are granted authority to inform, but they don't. They don't have the authority to rule. Okay, stop there. That's humongous. <laughs> okay, so I think this is probably one of the most valuable practical applications, at least for me. You know, I'm a student of personality types, right? And you know, one of the coolest things about the scriptures, and I've always loved this, is that you know there are four gospels. Yeah. And it's just so cool in this this four gospels, and of course we hear all the different personalities of the disciples as well. But you know, right there in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we've talked about this before, but it's interesting that you go back to Hippocrates, which is like the father of medicine, right? If you look back, what three thousand years or whatever, the origins of someone on this planet going, "Hey, people are different." No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and there were four different kind of personality types of, of that era, right? Just saying, hey, there's there's different people. Um, and of course, you know, you see in modern psychology, Carl Jung and others who are like, hey, there are. Yeah, there's kind of some categories to this. Well, I've I've um, been a student of that and also, you know, paid attention to people in teams. Right. And so I think they're good vocabulary to kind of help you understand. But somebody said to me, they said, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm, yeah. And of course, I always think about the, you know, here I'm in Central Texas and, you know, we had football tonight, right? Friday night lights. And I think about these guys that are the, and we've got guys, coaches like this. And I was at a breakfast this morning for my sons. They finished their season, middle school football. And one of the coach's sons, the coach himself is probably... 325 pounds of muscle wow and his son everyone knows hates football hmm. his son is the biggest kid on the team and everyone knows that his father is making him play football and he got up in front and got his little award and the coach said everybody knows this boy hates football and in that interesting his father is making him play football yeah. And, you know, the, the, the example is this. I was in theater all my life, and it's like your dad is, you know, alpha male football player. And, you know, he, you know, puts a football in the crib and, you know, plays rough with the boy. And then once the boy gets to a certain age, he's like, I just want to dance, dad. And you're like, <laughs> ah, right. He's like, <laughs> OK, so there are different personalities here. And I think what's really cool about the Gospels is. We see Matthew, which starts with this lineage, right? It starts with this, hey, we need to connect to historical, you know, if this doesn't connect back to literally Adam himself, right? If we yeah. can't tie this back to David, if we can't show that historically that this guy, Jesus, is the Messiah, you're not going to prove it to me. And so you've got this perspective of a back looking or, you know, um, historically, you know, you've got Mark, who's as quick and dirty as you get. And then you've got Luke, which is the most fascinating to me. And I've met so many people like this in my life who are very rational people. Yeah. And we see them in business a lot. You know, um, you look at a guy like Steve Jobs and you don't see an accountant. You look at a guy like Steve Jobs and you don't see, um, honestly, a CEO. You no. see an artist, you know, a creative. And... What's interesting is when I see leadership, I see people who are wired for facts and figures and, and, and data. And of course, what does it say? If you look at the introduction to Luke, it's literally, 
he was commissioned to give the accurate account. And I love it that it's here we have juxtaposed against three other gospels, a rational doctor who says, all right, these bozos, they told you the wrong story. I'm going to tell you the right story. And it's so classic with those who make decisions based on their thinking. Yeah. And then you've got this guy, John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, this narrative of all narrative, this journey of hijinks and, and it's, it's a, I mean, it's the greatest, you know, I don't know, super villain story that exists. Right. And what I love about that is that it acknowledges the fact that I'm somebody who loves the book of John. Right. I, I appreciate the scriptures, but I am often led by the feelings and emotions. And I think there are people, whether you're the the guy that's like, boy, you're going to play football, or you're just like, no, I'm on the creative side of this, and I literally wear my heart on my sleeve, and I am sensitive. Like, Steve, all my life when somebody was sick, I felt sick. Yeah. Wow. When I saw someone get injured, I felt injured. Hmm. Um, I've had empathy deep empathy and i've had to fight it actually because it takes me like if i see if i see an accident on the side of the road like i literally it's weight on me wow and some people are like maybe you shouldn't have been driving that fast like i know people in my life who if somebody's crying somebody broke a bone and they've got it sticking out the side of their arm or like that kind of sucks to be you yeah i'm not i'm not kidding i know no, people like I that that, I cannot I well. function that way, right? Yeah. So to bring this all home, and that was a, a long example of, of why I'm justifying my ridiculous <laughs> behavior, is that no matter how we see the world, God has fashioned us since the beginning, right? Knew us, knit us together. Yeah. And there should be no better example with our uniquenesses and our experiences and our differences to understand that if we rule with him in the fullness of his nature and character and that our yeses and nos are to bless and protect when we align with that it's this it's this beautiful thing yeah. but we also have to be guarded right so my buddy who's like maybe you shouldn't ride a motorcycle man but he's dead like he's is like he's pulled in pieces and I'm like freaking out. And he's like, well, yeah. shouldn't have drove a motorcycle, buddy. There are people like that. And I go, yeah. how can you possibly see things that way? Well, that's how God created people. And you think about it and you go, okay, we need to have these practical tools. And one of the things you're saying, no matter how you're wired, stepping outside of something and letting your yes be your yes and your no being your no gives you the ability to do it with him yes and i feel like my emotions that overtake me is the attack of me putting myself at the center right i'm gonna let these things rule i've given them permission to make me ineffective yeah and and well, i've i've given them that authority yes you have and by the way, we all do. And and hey, listen, this nobody does this stuff on purpose with forethought. Right. Oh, okay, yeah, my emotions are going crazy. Oh, it sounds like a good idea to put them in charge. Let's do that. <laughs> you know, well, we, we don't we don't we don't think like that. We think we are being empathetic or we are being concerned or we're being, you know true to what's actually happening. I'm not going to be false. I'm going to be true. This is what's really happening, etc. Well, all of that is accurate. What is missing is the realization of what we are called and created to do, which is to be one, to rule with Jesus in the fullness of his nature and character with him, and to be in order to do that, and when we do that, that we're going to be bigger than the problem. So if there is a problem, my, my emotions may be informing me about the severity of the problem. They may be informing me about the target of the problem. They may be um, informing me about all kinds of valuable information that needs to be, uh, needs to be known and collected because it's going to support 
the ruling effort. Well, that's not a negation of the importance and value of the, uh, of the emotions. It is to identify what the role of those emotions are in ruling. So likewise with the person who's much more sterile, there is going to come a point in time where there are circumstances where an incredibly sterile point of view, point of view is absolutely essential. Well, guess what? That is a form of emotional expression. I have none. I don't care to have any. I will seal off and cut off any emotional display. This is simply a calculation, and we will deal with it as if it were an equation. One plus one equals two. Take away the one, and you don't have the two. Okay? You see where I'm going with all of this? It's, it's, yeah. And it's learning how whatever it is, however it is that God has built us, that those are to support ruling with him, not to take over ruling apart from him. Wow. Which that's is the enormous. whole exchange. Yeah, that's enormous. And, and you think about it, I'm actually glad there are people like that because when they're actually ruling with him in his nature and character, I want that person in the midst of the wreck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want that person to say, nope, jaws of life. Got to take care of the situation. I got a buddy who's a trauma surgeon and I'm like, how in the world do you do it? And he's like, yeah, right dude, on. all this plumbing's the same. That's what he says. He's like, yeah. all this plumbing's the same. I said, does it ever like, he's like, no, I understand how it works and how it fits together. You know, to me, I, I don't know what a pancreas looks like. <laughs> I just want to know. <laughs> Mine doesn't work so good, but I know that, but he does, and he knows where it is, yeah. and he's seen a hundred of them, yeah. or a thousand of them, and I think what's really cool, though, is that God made people that way, and I'm glad that they are. You know, I, I look at my wife, who's a guardian. That's the terminology I would use for her, and I call her super mom. Why? Because she is concerned about blessing and protecting. I mean, nobody I know makes better decisions than my wife in blessing and protecting children, the family the institutions of all that, but also um, it's different. It's different for everyone. And I think what's so great is what you're saying is universal. Yes. It's not based on one personality or another. It's saying, hey, understanding who you are and how you can easily be drawn offside. So for me, it's an emotional thing. And I think about football. You know, what are you trying to do with a hard count? You're trying to get the guys off sides. Why? Because I get five yards if I've got it. Well, if you want to come and attack me, Steve, it's it's on the emotional side of things. Yep. Right? Yep. And so, you know, I think understanding how you're easily attacked or where your vulnerabilities are, I think, is a wise thing to, to consider. But to know that with him and his nature and character, right, this idea of with him, because you said it right. You said like, you may not have known that you were saying, I need to stop and step out of this. But that is what happened. But it sounds like the more that you understand this and practices it, that you can literally get to the point where you can see it and identify it almost as it's happening. Because I feel like I get overwhelmed by it versus going, oh, it's coming. No. Because I think that what that would material in my life would be, people would be like, hey, Wow, you're you're kind of calm in the storm, and that's what I see in you, Steve. Honestly, I see you calm in the storm. Is that personality or is that practice or both? Well, it's both, but it's also positional. You know, um, you know I'll, I'll tell you. I'll just give you a little example. Um, I was going through a really rough time at one time. I mean, I've gone through a bunch of these over the course of my life. You can't be in the game without uh, experiencing some competitive fodder along the way. Um, and so we were, going, we were going through a really, really tough time. And off in the distance, I saw this figure off in the distance 
And I couldn't make it out, didn't know what it was, but it looked like it was kind of a human form. So way, way off in the, in the spiritual distance. Um, and I looked at it, I watched it, and I watched it, and it started to come toward me. And as it got closer and closer, I recognized it as Jesus. And you go, um, and he looked exactly the way John described him in Revelation 3 with the eye, you know, with the eye, uh, eyes of fire and the, and the bronze and the white hair. Looked exactly like that. And I thought, whoa, dude. <laughs> the, the, John wasn't just making this stuff up. That, that is for real. And around him was a swirling whirlwind um, devastating whirlwind that was around him. A raging windstorm was just swirling around him. And he was at perfect peace in, in this thing. And so I looked at him and watched him. And so finally, this happened over a couple of days, by the way. So finally, on the, on the third day, I think it was on the third morning, I said, okay, Lord, you who are standing in the midst of the raging windstorm, what say you? Hmm. And he said, come and stand with me in the midst of the storm. Wow. Who says that? <laughs> well, Jesus, clearly. Oh, my God. Wow. Come and stand with me in the midst of of the raging windstorm. So I go to my wife, I say, Marsh, here's what's going on, here's what's happening. Here's what I asked Jesus, here's what he said. What do you wanna do? You see the choice that is present? And she said, I don't think we have a choice. I think we need to say yes. What is the purpose of yes? To empower so as to mobilize. And so he said, okay, Jesus, we'll come. We'll stand with you in the midst of the raging windstorm. And so, yeah, it's not only attitude and practice and things of that nature, it's also essentially positioning. He is not just described to be the peace in the midst of the storm. Wherever he goes, the reaction to him, and it's part of this proaction reaction thing we've talked about. Wherever he goes, he kicks up all kinds of reactions around him, every one of which is designed to try to create havoc and fear to take what is orderly and turn it into disorder. By the way, not because Satan likes operating in disorder, he doesn't. He, his entire kingdom has to, has to operate with precise order in order for it to function. It's just that he can't produce it because there is no order in him. And so the result of everything is this raging storm that he produces. And Jesus says, hey, just come and stand with me. That's so big, Steve. You know, it, it makes me think about him turning over the tables. It makes me think about him sleeping in the boat. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you know, you, you say that, that the swirling windstorm is actually potentially a product of him. That's an interesting, very, very counterintuitive thought for a lot of people. They think of meek and mild Jesus as, you know, sitting with children, petting a, a lamb and, you know, drinking tea or something, you know, it's like he's a, he's passive. And what is interesting about this is all of these lessons that were taught by him when he was here were in the midst of very serious things, right? Yes. It seems like, you know, I mean, death, I mean, storms and all of these things. And it's, um, it's interesting that you say that because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of whatever the challenge may be, it may be life and death, right? It may actually be like 
hey, we may, we're going to die in the storm. And why are you sleeping? Right. And this is a tool and a means by which you're going to learn something. It could also be, hey, Steve, you got cancer. And you're like, holy crap. All right, Jesus, do we take this seriously? What do we do? And then you see the smiley face, which I think is so awesome. But it's like, hold on a second. Now I understand. Consider it pure joy, brothers, when facing troubles of many kind. What are those things if they are not opportunities? Right? Opportunities to see things from his perspective. Yeah. Because in a way, you have no need to be in the center of it if there were no storm. Yeah. It's interesting to think that that also you'd see, and it makes things like, hey, follow me, make a lot more sense. Well, hey, like I was sharing with you, you know, and and Ray, when we were joking around a little bit in the in the green room, um, it's one thing to stand uh, to sit in the stands and watch Nolan Ryan throw a ball under the chin of somebody and go, "Oh, wow, look at that!" You just saw oh, what. It's another to actually be the guy whose chin was buzzed by that 100 mile an hour fastball. Well, guess what? Guess what your choice is? Your choice is to get in the middle of the storm or your choice is to observe the storm from a distance. Well, what do you want to do? There's a seat for both of us. You know, what seat do you want to occupy? And, you know, we have made these things so so much about ideas and doctrines and teaching lessons and all of this stuff that we have forgotten that when Jesus stood um, in the garden and they came and, and you know the crowd the three to five hundred people came with clubs and you know and mallets to come take them away and they said you know and he said hey who have you come who have you come for and they said jesus and he said i am and when he says spoke those words it knocked them all back on their on their butts now what i want to know is is who is the guy that thought it was a good idea to get up after being knocked on my keister to think i'm going to take this guy somewhere right who who had that idea you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, guys. Do you did you just observe what this dude did? He simply answered the question and he knocked all of us on our keisters. What are we doing? Let's pause for a minute, step outside of this situation and say, OK, why are we here? And why did this guy just knock us on our butts? What are we about to get involved in here? We don't do that. Because the system of darkness works with us being at the center of everything. And so it doesn't matter what happens to us. As long as we remain in the center, it functions. The moment we get out of the center, we're a threat. Wow. And that's the game. And it's thus you have Jesus standing in front of Pilate. Yeah, you know, don't you know that I have the authority to free you or to crucify you? Pilate, you would have no authority over me if it was not first given to you from above. Hmm. I would start thinking about why he gave you that authority. And Satan, you the guy, hey, and I'm talking to the guy behind you, Pilate. Satan, I, I would give some a second thought to this if I were you. Now, you won't do it because you don't have any wisdom in you, but I would suggest you doing it because there's a whole lot of hurt that's about to happen. The storm, the raging windstorm that you've created around me is about to come home to roost. I'd be careful. No, he isn't. He doesn't know how to be. He has no wisdom in him. And so everything that Jesus does is a parable and a riddle to him. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Anyway, anyway. How amazing is that? Well, Steve, this is this is incredible and this has been fantastic. 
Wow. You know what's so neat about it though is it it's you know you you mentioned many streams ago the beauty of the truth is you can probe it. Yeah. And you know what I really love about this is no matter how much we talk about this, it seems like its depth is never ending. Yeah, that you is just true. continue to deepen and deepen and deepen and deepen in this. And you know it's interesting what when you when you told that story, right? Pilate and Jesus, right? And authority, right? A lot of what we're talking about here, it really begins, and it's so amazing how it was started with this this almost um binary thing, right? We hear who who is God, and it's like I am. Yeah. And we talked the other day about computer technology, and I think it was really cool. And we talked about the quantum, this idea of yes. And if you think about a zero and a one, when yeah. when when I am is said, that's one. Yeah. You think about yes. And what did you say a yes is? Yeah. To empower, to mobilize. Yeah. And think about what a yes is. Well, when you create, you say yes. And I was thinking about that. Whatever you make, I, I like... um. I like making stuff. I like to draw stuff. I like to carve stuff. I like to, I just like to make things and I very rarely have time to do it, but I just, I just like making things. You know, I love craftsmanship. I love watching a bunch of, you know, weird videos online about people that are sleeping out. Some guy hollowed out a tree and slept in it overnight, or, you know, somebody created this really cool, beautiful, you know, knife that was made out of Damascus or this craftsmanship of these people that are making samurai swords. And I see in that, yes, I see in this idea of saying, well, you know what's so amazing? And it's such a separator of who we are from this world. And it's this defining factor of what makes us part of him. And I, I think about exercising that creative ability and I just was listening to Richard Hart. So Richard Hart has finally like given us more than just a little bite. He he did a 47 minute audio recording and it oh, came wow. out just recently. Yeah. And I kind of was listening to it going, I thought humble Richard was the one that was out now. And anyway, <laughs> he has a hard time not being proud of himself, but he has been an incredible advocate for a lot of people. And we're in the midst of, Stan Bank went freed, potentially going to jail for life. He's yeah. seven counts, 110 years potential. And, you know, I think about when he says this, he's like, if you want a picture of a pony, you can draw one. And it's such a simple, it's, a, it's such a simple concept of yes. And so when I kind of bring this all the way back to crypto, right? You're on a crypto channel. There's something really cool about what's happening right now in this world. You talk about it as the transfer. But what I'm understanding in this transfer is I think of transfer is it's going to be transferred to me and I'm going to have a lot and you're going to not have a lot. And what in reality of all of this is that, and we talked about this last time, it all starts with me. Yeah. And it's really a transfer of my own heart to be aligned with the very nature of why it was all created. And so it's so interesting because it's so counterintuitive, the whole story of Jesus, right? Well, why didn't you say anything, Jesus? And, and, you know, why did you go to that cross? And what they didn't realize when, what, an eclipse, an earthquake, and the veil was torn from the top down, what did it usher in? And then him to go into the, you know, the depths of hell and to be resurrected, this idea that all of these things would, would change. And... <clears throat> I think about it prior to the resurrection. You know, I, I learning in church, I had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was. Yeah. I thought he was just a dude that showed up on the scene. And what I didn't realize was, no, all things were created for him and by him. And those that were talking to him prior to him coming is the same thing, that he was almost putting an exclamation point on the purpose of creation to say, you know what, if we're going to do this together, my kingdom come, my yeah. will be done on earth as it is in heaven, well, then you need to have the means to do that. And that means to do it is ultimately, I mean, picture a picture, story after story, parable after parable of trying to show you who you are in him. Yeah. 
And you know what's amazing is I was on a call with a, a guy that I had just met, and so many people in this world are like, I'm doing this thing over and over again. I wake up and I do this thing and I'm and I don't have I don't feel a sense of purpose in my life. I don't feel like what I'm doing and how I'm operating in this world is connected to anything of substance or purpose. Yeah. And what I think is so incredible about how you've articulated these things and really given me the vocabulary is to say, well, let's go back to the very beginning of why it's even here. And then to think about what are the implications of you ruling his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character? Well, that means that I've got to know what his nature and character is. I've got to like, am I interested in knowing this stuff? And when it, when it all kind of gets packed together with, well, start by recognizing that Jesus is alive and he speaks. And I'm like, Wow. If you take all of that and wrap it up, you know what? I go to church and you know what I hear? What's that? Jesus is dead and we'll mm. see him on Easter Sunday. Yeah. And in the meantime, we're going to worship this Bible. Yeah. Because Jesus did some great things. He was a he was a good guy. Yeah. But in and, and, and I don't blame them because that's kind of the routine of the of the program. But, you know, I've always felt like well, since I was a kid, there's got to be more to this. There, look at all these miracles, Steve. Look at all these incredible things that happened over and over again. And it's like as you probe this truth and realize it, you're like, OK, OK. It's like this church thing for me was just. It was just an appetizer. Right. It was just I mean, it, I it, without it, I wouldn't have paid much attention. Now, you could say I might have just because of the nature of how this is created, but I'm thankful for it. And I'm thankful for a number of people in my life who came through that kind of church experience who actually took a, an interest in me and said, hey, you know, and, and, and spoke into my life. But this whole deal with you and I mean, there's more growth, I think, in my kind of spiritual life in the last year than in the last 23 years. Hmm. And that's big. That's a big deal, because what is it? because it actually has practical application now it's not a religious idea or hey it's it's no i'm aligning myself with like how it's actually designed and if i look at anyone in science anyone in technology what are they trying to do everything i see them creating is mimicking the creation yeah. if it's if it has any value it does yeah yeah so thank you steve well, thank you, Lord. I mean, you know, he he's uh, he's a he's a man who's true to his word, and um, if he says follow me, then it's worth it. Um, so I want to I want to do something different. I just had okay. a little uh, a little quinky dink here. Okay, anyone that's in the chat, any question that you have, let's ask Steve it. Okay, anything that you're like, I've been watching these things, but I, I still don't understand this, and nothing is off base. Nothing yeah. is out of bounds. You can ask absolutely anything, and I won't make fun of you because Brandon's not on the stream. He'll make fun of you. <laughs> no, he's in the he's in the chat. It's so good to see Rags here. Um, but no, seriously, if you've got a question, you're like, "Hey, what do you think about this?" Or I've always had a hard time understanding this thing that happened. Or what do you say about? I don't know what whatever it is. Um, you know, for example, well, I don't even want to insert anything. So I want to leave space for people to ask that question. Um, and so it's open. The chat is open for any question that you would want to ask of Steve um, while we've got him here for another 30 <laughs> minutes. Um, by the way, my father-in-law is super happy about the Rangers winning. <laughs> and, and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm happy for him. He's been, what was it? The Washington senators. Is that what it started out as? Yeah. And then yeah. became the Rangers. He's been a, he has literally been a fan since moment one. And just so I'm just so happy for him that he got to see it. You know, no. it's, it's baseball. It's not life, but it's so cool. Um, did you get a chance to watch the, the series? Yeah. Yeah, I did. And it was, it was fun to watch. I mean, it, it, um, you know, I think it was game, maybe game four. Uh, they showed, speaking of the senators, you know, Frank Howard, you know, they, they give a little uh, memorial to him. 
because he had passed away, I think at that, that day. Hmm. And, um, oh yeah. And, uh, I remember Frank, when he came up with the Dodgers playing in right field, this mammoth of a human being who was six, seven in those days. I mean, he was every bit of, you know, five inches taller than, than anybody else on the field. So, okay, Steve, do you think uh, you would have played well under Billy Martin if you had played for the A's in 1980? <laughs> um, great question, ID. Um, yes, like any player, um, for three years. Billy had a shelf life of about three years. And he was a fabulous manager year one through three. Then in about four, he started to become the center of the universe. Um, in year five, he started to being the black hole that starts sucking everything into him. And if he made it to year six, um, he, he would lose the clubhouse. Uh, and so... Yeah, I think I would have done really well under Bill. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, ID, since you, since you like, uh, asked the question about Billy. Um, friend of mine, um, we were best friends growing up. He was the um, shortstop for, uh, for the Boston Red Sox, Rick Burleson back in those days. He was one of the early shortstop in, in those days. Uh, um, top guys went to the Angels before he blew his arm out, but he played for Billy. And he was telling the story. He was telling the story of uh, there was a game. They had a game, and they were they were beating this team. I forget who it was, and they were up like you know ten or twelve to nothing. And in the last inning, the other team scored about four or five runs. Game over. Everybody's in the clubhouse. And, uh, you know, celebrating and high-fiving and stuff like that. Well, Billy came into the clubhouse and started throwing stuff all over the clubhouse, throwing chairs and turning tables and screaming like a madman uh, to the team. And one of the guys stopped and said, hey, Billy, what are you doing? We just won 12 to 4. He said, no, you didn't. He said, you were winning 12 to nothing. You put up, should have put your heel in their neck, but instead you gave them life, and tomorrow they're going to come back and they're going to beat your ass. And guess what the team did? Came back and beat them. <laughs> that was Billy Martin and why he had such a fabulous impact the first couple of years, two, three years with a team. But wow. no, I think I would have done well. That's awesome. For three awesome. years. <laughs> yeah, for three years. Crypto Pez, thanks for being here. Uh, need to go back to the juicy bits. Friday nights in Spain are not the same without you two. That's so nice to hear. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much for sharing that, Crypto Pez, and thanks for being here. David Lee asked this question. I'm going to add to this question, Steve, because I think I know what he's saying, because I hang out with David Lee on occasion. He yeah. says, Steve, what do you think about is the purpose of this awakening and gathering? Sorry if too broad. I think what, what Steve is saying, too, is, David Lee and I have experienced this because he's followed everything we've done in this whole Right Side Up series. I've talked about you a ton. He was, you know, he's been part of this since the moment that, you know, we had the Texan meetup. But even broader than that, um, David Lee has recognized what's been happening with us as a team. Hmm. And I told you, remember, I told you that story about the Lord saying to me, I've hidden something in the house for you. Yes. And, and it's behind you. Like I've, I haven't had that kind of like direct clear stuff and to find that, that Xanax bottle with, with state quarters in it and how impactful that was for that next step for us. Cause that's what actually led the decision-making for doing the whole Texan thing. We had two opportunities and it was like, which one do we do? And it's like, Michael says, Hey, ask him, right? That's basically what he said, ask him. And what did he say? Hey, I'm going to show you this thing that's going to be, a picture of this and that picture was hey the money is going to attract a lot of people um and what is the purpose of them being attracted to this thing well they think that this man-made creation of money is going to bring them or anesthetize them and bring them peace but don't forget that it's actually a man-made creation 
that is a temporary fix. David and I have seen that there is this awakening, it feels like, right? Yes. What are we talking about? I said to you before, Lord, I should I preach the gospel? And he's like, no. <laughs> and now it's like, no, this you need to understand what the, the real gospel is. It, it actually is good news if it's this. Yeah. So what do you, I know that's really broad, but there seems to be an awakening and a gathering of God's people, and it's not church people. We talked about that. Yeah, um, and I'll take both those, um, both the question as well as your um, your money inside the, you know, inside the Xanax bottle, uh, and just offer you a couple of thoughts. Yep. Um, a little bit ago, I mentioned about the culture of the world, and wherever wherever you have a gathering of of people, they pr they not only possess, but then express the life source that is present within that group. In a company, I used to, when in my consulting days, I used to share with folks that the most valuable thing that we possess as a company is not our product, not our service, um, not our money, not our position, not our market share. It's the culture that we produce that is the, the unspoken, invisible reality of who we are as a company. And when a person walks, comes out of the elevator and walks into our presence, the very first thing they'll be impacted by is our culture. Right. The, and they won't know what it is. They don't know why it is. But eventually you'll start hearing them say things like, wow, I came in. I always feel so welcome when I come here. You know, folks are always so cheerful. Oh, when I see people walking by, they've always got, you know, this look of determination and satisfaction on their face. They'll tell you what it is that the culture is producing that you haven't spoken a word. But you, but this comes from the inside out. Well, the culture of the world um, is um, the way Jesus calls the culture of the world. It's called he calls it spiritual ether. And the picture that he showed is like, you know, we're in a hospital bed with this IV in, in, our, in our arms and we're, a, we're nearly half, you know, groggy and half asleep. Um, and that spiritual ether is designed to keep us in a semi-state of slumber. We can't be totally asleep because then we're no use as slaves, but we have to be kept enough asleep in order to not really understand and be sensitive to what is happening in the spiritual dimension of life, spiritual ether. Well, guess what you have? You have a container, a bottle, with something that anesthetizes, and inside of it are coins. And so what the part of that picture is, is money is used to keep us bottled up in this spiritual ether. And so the, the objective is to release the tool from the spiritual ether so it can fulfill its divine purpose. Okay. And you've been entrusted with that. And the way that the Lord describes it to you is unlocking ge global generosity. Well, guess what you have to do? And you also use the term letting the genie out of the bottle. All of these terms are describing that idea of releasing the cap of the spiritual ether and re and freeing the resources to perform their di their divine purpose. Wow. Um, okay, but you got to free them from the spiritual ether. Unlock it. Unlock it. See? So that generosity can flow, so the creation can do what it does, which is to produce abundance. All right? Now, awakening. In about, I think it was sometime in about 2017, I'll have to go back and look at it. I actually sent out an email to a number of folks about it. Um, Carter may remember it. If Joe is on the is on here, Joe may remember it. There are a few folks that might remember this um, if they may be on the on the stream or not. But anyway, what I saw was I saw this massive um, body of people, and they were all in this state of slumber. But all of a sudden 
there was this movement that began to happen, this shape, this, and they started to shake, if you will, not violently, but they began to move and start. And what you could tell is they were starting to arouse from sleep. So when I hear awakening, that's what I relate to. That Jesus said, hey, I am arousing my people. They're getting ready to move, but I have to awaken them before we can actually mobilize to our destination. And so when I see awakening, that's when I hear things like awakening, that's what I hear. Okay, we're waking up. Now, how does God wake us up? Um, well, there are these little things called alarms. I remember, for example, when uh, when Clinton uh, was elected, and when he was elected president, it, he was elected in in spite of things that, in normal elections, would have you know canceled him out in 15 minutes. In fact, you've seen a lot of other subsequent, um, not only previous but subsequent candidates who had his trouble that, I mean, they didn't last 15 more, 15 more minutes once it came out, but yet for him, he came out, um, you know, and not only was immune to it, ended up being elected president, not once, but twice. So I said, Jesus, what in the world is going on here? How can this actually happen? And he said, Bill is my alarm clock. He will be the first to awaken my people. And so I start thinking, alarm clock, what's that? And I didn't think much about that until I realized that an alarm clock is violent to the one who's sleeping. So part of this awakening that we're going through is we are experiencing some violence in the form of the alarm clock that is shaking us and waking us up out of this spiritual ether that has got us in a spiritual state of slumber to waken us up so that we can then begin to collect and move into our proper role and perform that role with Jesus and each other. So that that's very broad, but that's that uh, that's what comes to me through the question. That's fantastic. And that's super helpful. And boy, what a, you know, it's amazing, right? You know, we, we started this whole thing talking about breathing life right and you know we start out like have, has anyone ever like said hey you can do it and you just did that for me steve oh huh. wow no you really did you know and it's you know i think a lot of times whether it's suffering in silence or thinking in kind of solitude is that the true things get reinforced right so one of the things that's interesting is you know, most people don't see this on stream, but we do a lot. We have a lot of conversations outside of streams, of course, and a team of people. And this whole calling of unlocking global generosity has morphed and has grown and it has become more substantial. But every time I ever talked about it and used those terms in, there's always been real intrigue and interest. Yeah. And in, in probably no other three words that I've ever spoken that haven't had such an impact. And it's it it leads you, it leads you by the wrist, if you will, in a direction. And I can't help but think that this idea that all these stories that Jesus told about, hey, I'm a shepherd, and the sheep recognize my voice. And it's amazing. You know, I've been thinking about how do you share this stuff in less than two hours? <laughs> right? Like I've been thinking about this going, hold on. You know, this is something that you, know, you think about shouting it from the rooftops. You know, I now understand why Paul walked around the Mediterranean four times. Yeah. I mean, I get it now. I mean, I understand it. Well, because he understood this, but what happened to him? Think about this. He literally was blinded. So one of his sensory functions is gone and he hears from Jesus. Yeah. That's an amazing idea and story. But how amazing that when you hear from and you are, I mean, you think of that journey, what did Paul do? 
And what did it cause him to do? And you think about what that yes is of mobilizing and, you know, empowering. That's what I think is so incredible about this time that we're living in is I feel like Jesus is saying yes to us. And what is the yes to? Um, to me, I can think of nothing greater than having a sense of peace that transcends all understanding that I can't even describe that is packed with purpose yeah. and, and like a trajectory. Like, hold on, you mean like I matter? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people that are out there who go, and, and I often bring this up on my streams. I go in and I get a soda in the morning. I get a soda, you know, mm -hmm. and always there's somebody in front of me who's got two 20 ounce beers. It's like 730 in the morning. <laughs> and my dad was an alcoholic, so I understand. I understand that whole thing. But I think about, you know, self-medicating and, and what it means. It's like so many people in this world, whether they're medicating or not, often think that, hey, this world and the way that it's being led is being telling you that this is the best it's going to get and you just need to endure it. And it's like, you're the descendant of a monkey, you crawled out of the ooze and you're just here for a short time and you're going to die and turn back into dust and people are going to forget your name. Yeah. Um, what do you say to people who are there, who are feeling that way, that have no hope? Well, I mean, it's a thing that we talk about all the time. Go to the guy who's got hope, you know, and, you know, kind of seems like a pretty simple approach, you know, it, it's, it's like the guy who was asking me about, you know, all the business, where did I come up with all the business ideas and concepts that he had never heard so he could go read about it and learn about it himself. And I said, well, the guy who built business, if you want to know about business, go talk to him. He, he's happy to share. And he's got ideas about business that just, you know, blow your mind. Again, that seem backwards but they're only backwards to the upside down world. The right side down, right side up world is what, you know, is perfectly normal. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting you're talking about, um, you know, awakening. Well, what happens? What, what is the implication to awake? What is the, what is the previous state before awake? Isn't it asleep? Yeah. Okay. So if you were, if you were, let's just call him out. If you were Satan and the head of his kingdom, and you knew that there was, a, that what was happening is that there was a rustling and a rumbling among those who really want to know and follow Jesus and to learn how to live with him. And they have been asleep and they're about to awake, awake awake. How would you feel about that? And you knew every single one of them had the capacity to do what we were talking about on Monday, that in the midst of the most intense attack on you, all you needed to do was say, nope, that isn't where we're going. That isn't what we're going to do. That's a no. What I am going to do, which is a yes, is I'm going to step outside of this thing and look at it for what it really is with Jesus to get an idea how he's seeing this thing. Yeah. How would you feel if you were Satan? And more importantly, how would you feel about all those people, uh, all those other angels who bought into his program? Eh? Let me tell you what. They're terrified and they are scrambling like crazy because they know we're about to awake. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's, it's funny that you say that. So Hexter is here, right? Yeah. I thought at first that this question was a joke, but it's not a joke. And so he says, what was Christ? And he's like, I'm not religious, so I don't know. And I think it's really cool. So Hexter one, welcome. And thanks for asking the question. I mean, there is no question that is out of bounds on this stream. That is for sure. So, so if you were to say to someone that he's like, Hey, what was Christ? 
what was this? You know, we use this term. It's like even, you know, you kind of think about it. I think it's a pretty really genuine question. Hey, is this yeah. guy's last name Christ? Like, what does yeah. that mean when you say the Christ and you think about people saying, well, you you are the Christ? What does that mean? Yeah, that's great. Um, it, it comes out of the, of course, part of that era. And remember, in that era, <clears throat> There were not the governments, there weren't governments like we see them today. They were just starting to form. They were kingdoms. And so kingdoms had kings. And so kings were initiated um, into, their, into their role. So in the Hebrew um, history, they were anointed with oil. And so this oil was a picture of the saturation of the spirit of God over the primary leader that he was presumed to have appointed over Israel. So the whole idea of anointing was the pouring of oil, which was a representation, again, of, of the spirit of God that then saturated from the head, the mind, all the way down. And then guess what it would do? Touch the eyes, the ears, the mouth go over the entire body so that the king was viewed as being um, the anointed and selected by God to rule his people. That's why David, in the story between David and, um, and Saul, David said he would not touch the Lord's anointed. Say why? Because he was saturated with the spirit of God and was appointed. And as God appointed him, so God was the only one who had, had the authority to remove him. Okay, there's the picture of staying inside and working with God versus outside, which the whole book of Kings and Chronicles are about how people on the outside took matters in their own hands to kill God's anointed. So that's where the anointing concept comes from. The word Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. And so when you, if you were to if you were to translate that into, into English, it would be Jesus, the anointed one. Um, and so that anointed one, Christ, was an indication that he was the one that God had, had deposited in him the fullness of his spirit in order to rule his people. And of course, that then you see in the story of Jesus meeting up with John the Baptist, how the dove descended on him, you know, from heaven, like the spirit. And it said, and then you heard the voice out of heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So actually that's a lot of information around that if you ever want to get to it. But Jesus's name, the Christ or Christ means the anointed one, which indicates that he was the specific one to whom God had deposited all authority to rule. So let me ask you this. I'm curious about this one. You know, we, we look at the term and we hear the concept of the Messiah, right? Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've been paying attention to this whole Jewish conflict too. And, you know, somebody was with, um, what's his name? Ben uh, Shapiro. And it was, it was somebody that didn't, I think it was Joe Rogan, I actually asked him. And he asked him, who is Jesus to Ben Shapiro, this, mm. you know, practicing Jew. And, um, he, he kind of was stumbling over that one, but he was, he was like, well, he was, he was a guy that they killed, you know, this leader he killed and who and what were, and where does the term Messiah fit into this concept? Jesus, the anointed one or the Christ, how, how, how would you place Messiah into that? Cause people were looking for one. They were anticipating one who would come. Yeah. Um, Messiah is, is, his work, uh, I guess you could describe it as chosen one. Um, Christ, the, the, the Greek word Christos is used to translate uh, Messiah, the anointed one, chosen one. And so that concept comes out of, uh, out of the Hebrew scriptures that God sends a Messiah um, upon whom the government of the kingdom of God on his shoulders rests. And so it speaks primarily of one who is um, specifically chosen by God. And it's uh, and in the New Testament, 
that is then, um, let me back up. And so the idea behind the, within the Hebrew um, context is that the Messiah would come and then deliver Israel from all of its entanglements with the world and all of those that were attempting to beat down the world and then position Israel as the primary ruling kingdom on the earth. And so the Messiah is this chosen one who was to come from God, who was to actually assume that position uh, in order to restore to Israel their primary position of ruling the earth, um, you know, with God. That's where Messiah comes from. Um, what's interesting is that the first one to be identified as God's Messiah uh, was, Cyprus, was Cyrus, a heathen king. He was the first one to be called God's anointed, God's chosen. Um, and so I don't know how you, how you reconcile that, um, but other than God has his anointed ones, his chosen ones that he works with to accomplish certain things. And Cyrus was the first one to be identified then with that. What's also interesting is the you were talking about Luke. Well, the second uh, book that Luke wrote was Acts. And when you go into the you know first couple of verses of Acts, um, you know the disciples asked Jesus, "Is it at this time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel?" Well, why was that? Because they recognized Jesus as being the Messiah. So now their religious training was telling them that the Messiah was there to restore the kingdom to, to Israel. And Jesus says, man, how long have I been with you? You still don't get this thing? You know, so uh, that's, what, that's what relates to, you know, this whole Messiah. And the point is, is that, when you look through the lens of scripture to view everything, you're going to get a distorted view. You're going to view that through your own belief system, uh, as opposed to talking with Jesus, who then shows you his perspective on the scriptures, and then you get his view on them. If the Jews killed Jesus, why do Christians support Israel so much? <laughs> what, a, what a great rock, question. Rock on, Hex. Uh, right on, man. Well, the, the simple answer, without going into a whole lot, is that it goes back to the time of Abraham. And um, Jehovah said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. And so for those who bless the seed of Abraham, I will bless them. Well, Jesus comes from the seed of Abraham. And so Christians view Jesus um, as being the fulfillment of the seed of Abraham. And so their role is to support Israel, um, which was the lineage, if you will, the national lineage through which Jesus then came. So Christians, by and large, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority are, uh, I would say, are highly supportive of Israel because they also view Israel as being an a timing mechanism for the second coming of Christ when the huge portion of Israel is then then comes to the Lord and recognizes Jesus as um, as their Messiah. So there's a lot connected into that. But great okay. question. Very good question. Okay, I've got a curveball. Maybe it's <laughs> these maybe haven't it's a, been <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a knuckle slider. Um, knuckle curve. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um Okay. This this idea of um, what is Israel, yeah. right? So you know, because I follow hexagons on on Twitter, <laughs> I have all kinds of stuff in my feed, and one <laughs> of the things that's in my feed that I see a lot of times is um, what is Israel. And so some of the conspiracy folks would say, hey. This current day political Israel is a creation, a corporate creation of the Rothschilds, right? Hmm. I'm just saying what I've read. I, I haven't spent much time there. One of the things that I'm really curious about 
is because we see deception so often in this story of it kind of you thinking it's this, but it's really this, and it's actually kind of set up to deceive you, that we think of the political organization and the fact that the map says Israel on it, that that is what Israel is. Yeah. And of course, you know, I think about Jesus talking about, you know, you know, this temple is going to be torn down in three days. And they're like, what? This thing's been here. And, what? you know, there's, how is that possible? And of course, we understood he was talking about his body himself. How, how much you know, do you have any commentary on this idea that understanding Israel as something much broader than the political current, and I don't mean just borders of land, but the political apparatus of Israel versus what Israel is really? Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't want to. I mean, that's my best knuckle slider curve. Well, well, you're worth a lot of money if you can throw those. Yeah, those yeah, all together. Around. Let me tell you what. Um, I'll just offer a couple of thoughts. Okay. Um, Israel was the name that God gave Jacob. And so remember our, our discussion on naming rights. The one who names has authority over the one named. And the one who accepts a name comes under the, the authority of the one who gave the name. And so the picture we, we kind of painted in order to try to make it really simple is with our children. You know, we have children at home who names our kids. Do the grandparents name our kids? Do the, does the neighbor down the street? Does the president of the United States, who names our kids? Well, we name them. And so when we name them, under whose authority do our children fall? Well, they fall under our authority. And then it's our responsibility to grow them up, to bless and protect them, exercise the authority that God has given to us to bless and protect, nurture and raise them until the day comes when they separate, you know, from mom and dad's care, the ones who name them, to then go and you know join themselves you know to their mate and start the process all over again okay so that's naming rights so what <clears throat> so what god did with with jacob is he renamed him israel well israel means he who contends with god and so when you look at that you go oh that could mean who he who contends with and alongside of god it also can mean who he who contends in opposition with God. Well, guess what? That's our choice. Yeah. We are either going to contend with God as a partner with him, or we're going to contend in opposition to him, which James says is the assignment of those who fall in love with and are friendly with the world. Hmm. Okay. They are literally assigned to become an enemy of God to contend with him. So um, who is Israel number one? Well, Israel can be either. Either those who contend against him as an enemy or those who contend with him as a partner. And guess what? They're very hard to distinguish because they can look exactly alike, like just like the two watermelons on the shelf. Yeah. And how do you discern between the two? Lookalikes. They look alike. How do you discern between the two? So that's the broader macro kind of thing that then relates to the individual. Well, who are you? Hmm. Are you the Israel that contends with God as a partner? Or are you the Israel that contends against God as an enemy? The choice is yours. Thing. Now, from there, you can go into all the political things that then go out yeah. from there. See, and now the ripple starts to flow out of the out of the rock being dropped in the pond. Steve, you are a blessing to us all. I, you know, what is so great? I haven't run into a question where you didn't have like a a major aha. What a what a beautiful description. And what I love about it is. I think Joe said this. He's like, yeah, listening to Steve is like, 
he talks how I think Jesus would talk. <laughs> and it's evidence that you've been hanging around the guy for a long time. And it's so cool. And I long to be the same. You know, I long to, to, and it's so, it's beautiful. That was like one of the most beautiful things I've heard you say. Mm. And it's, of course, you relating this. But what a great end cap on what we're doing here. I mean, what it's like the absolute perfect, you know, wrap up of all this stuff. Are you going to do it with him? Or are you going to do it against him? And I stand here going, and ever since I decided to do it with him, it's a constant daily thing. Yeah. And what's fascinating about all of this is, you know, Ray and I spend probably the most time together talking about Jesus. Even though I talk a lot to you, Steve, <laughs> we we contend with him in in this way around these things every single day. And it's incredible the impact that you've had on our lives by just reminding us to ask him ourselves. And this idea that in order to actually consider that as an option, I have to recognize that he's alive. Yeah. And if yeah. I ask him, I have to recognize that he he speaks to us. And I've said it many times. I don't hear him audibly, but boy, I'm seeing him in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. And it's um it's an amazing journey. Um, and it's not without its attacks, too. That's the thing that I think this whole stream is establishing. But thank you for for giving vocabulary to and kind of tools to say, hey. And you said, I'm going to read what I wrote. And it's just, it's so worth saying like a hundred times. You have been built by him. You have been built to be superior to the problem. And if you think about this idea of standing with him in this whirling storm where there is peace and that you are the Israel that is partnering with him, that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And the question is this, if you're above ground breathing air, there's purpose and, and work for you to do. And what I love about it is it makes every single difficulty, every single experience I've had, like come together as useful in this next day. Yes. And, and Ray and I have said this many times. It's like, I don't know if it's a church or if it's a lie or what it is, but it, it you know, the joke I make to him is like, well, I, I got saved in 1989. I'm like, you know what? I had to go back to him today, this morning. And I was thinking about, give us this day our daily bread. And I was thinking about the manna that they'd never seen before. And they're like, hey, here's pro you know provision for us. It's like day by day, moment by moment thing. And I think we've been lied to to say that, well, you got your fire insurance. Um, and I just thank you for that. I really do. Because when you said to me, the first time you said to me, and you've said it probably a hundred times to me, name a person in your life that you have a relationship with that you don't talk to. And I was thinking about a book, Steve, yeah. this book called Jesus is Alive and He Speaks by Steve Staggs. That's the first line of the book. It really is. Name a, re name a person in your life that you have a relationship with that you don't talk to. Yeah. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait. Thank you, Steve, for all that you do. Thanks for this. This is number 28, folks. I appreciate you so much, Steve. Thank you. Likewise. And folks, have a great weekend. All right. We'll catch you in a minute. Whoo! Once again, God sees you out the corner of his eye. I love this stuff. This is so great, isn't it? It's it's refreshing. It is refreshing. And the generosity of Steve to give of his time. And then, you know, you see him in the zone, right? You ask him a question. It's like, he kind of looks up and it's like, bam. And it's so nice that God has designed it this way, that, that there would be those who would be willing to be generous with their time to share these things with us. But what is he doing? He's not trying to say, hey, look at Steve. He's saying, no, look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one in which we partner with. And if you want to have peace in your life, well, it's not, this isn't a religious thing. This is, hey, you got some interest? Well, this is how this thing's made. And having that perspective, it is, it's powerful stuff. And that's why I do this, folks. I do this because I want you to know that 
Um, there's real life in this journey and, and don't give up. I was in a really, really tough place this last week. I mean, really tough place. And I was listening to some things that were not good. And I'm sure so many of us get into these situations like that, where we're just listening to all of the lies. And I just would say to you, do not give up. There is hope. And in the midst of all this whirling, swirling wind that Steve talks about, there's going to be a lot of chaos and crisis. But we're going to stand and have a perspective and partner with the one who created it all. I'm just, uh, I'm excited about what that means, especially because you've been drawn to this thing and it's so fundamental, the resources, right? Not that we would worship money, but that it would be unlocked and released in this world and to see crypto and what it's done and what it could do. Imagine if it was animated with the very nature and character of God himself. Have a great weekend. Take care of yourself and don't mess with Texas. Take care, everybody.